Hey, for those of you who have not uh, met me, my name is Wes. Uh, my wife, Vanessa, and I, we pastor a church in Sherman Oaks. Uh, used to be in Encino, at Bethel Encino, uh, pre-COVID, uh, but we pastor a church in that area. And so just want to say uh, what an honor it is uh, to be here with you today. And for many of you, I know just about, uh, I've, I've met, but I've, I've, I know just about all of you um, at this point. But uh, for, for those of you who have not yet met me, uh, it is nice to, I guess I could say meet you, but I'm up here. Uh, but I, I'm going to stick around after service today, especially that there's cookies. Uh, but I'm going to stick around after service today if any of you have any questions. Uh, last week we spent just, a, I don't know, Pastor Dano's a good hour or so together just talking about sports and life and doctrine and the future. And one of the questions last week that Dwayne asked, he says, hey, uh, what's, what's next? And my answer, maybe a little bit coy, uh, was come back next week uh, because we're going to share that um, today. Um, I do want to just uh, just honor Pastor Dana and uh, for inviting me into this process. Can we just give it up for Pastor Dana? Um, no one likes uh, no one likes change of any kind. I, I I know some people they just they thrive on. I need constantly changing environments. Maybe you're married to that person. They paint the house uh, just every year, um, or they're always buying you know new furniture, and it's like what's wrong with the old furniture? Uh, but for the the rest of us, um, change can be a little bit difficult. We were joking. Jose and I were joking before service, and he said that his corner grocery store. They changed the locations of all the items. And he said, I just found out where everything's at. Why did you move it all around, you know? Um, but uh, change is a part of life. And in my 40 years on this planet, um, I've seen some changes have been good and some changes have been difficult. Uh, but in all of them, God is involved. And, um, and so the changes that I've resisted, those have been some of the difficult ones. Uh, the changes that I've embraced, uh, those have been some of just the beautiful ones, but they're a little bit scary because you have to embrace them, and you have to kind of embrace what the Lord is doing. And so today, um, I'm just going to preach for a few moments on what could the future look like, and specifically, what could the future look like uh, together? What could the future look like? Uh, because really what we're talking about is a blending or the marriage of two different congregations. Uh, one of them has a hundred year history, one of them almost five years history. And if you count, you know, all of our Bible studies, you know, because our church started in my living room. And uh, by the way, if you're part of our community at the house, can you just kind of wave at everybody? If you're part of the house LA, it's good to see everyone. If you need a tango instructor, Jose's your guy. Ba -ba -ba -ba. All right, Paul and Monica, just come on in, guys. <laughs> There's no sneaking in. <laughs> you guys can wave, obviously. They're a part of our church as well. It's good to see you guys. They just got back off vacation, and so I'm glad that good to see you guys. But um, where was I? Where was I? Oh, on the two becoming one in a marriage. And uh, marriages are exciting. Uh, my in-laws are actually in that business. Uh, they have a, just an incredible site in, outside of Atlanta that people come from all around uh, to come get married at. And it's such an exciting thing. And marriages are beautiful. Uh, but how many of you guys know that the marriage ceremony is so exciting, but then the work begins? It's like, yes, this is awesome. You guys are going to have a great honeymoon. And when the honeymoon phase is over, that's when the real work begins. By the way, the first uh, year of my marriage was incredible. It was awesome. I know some people say, oh, man, just wait till the honeymoon phase wears off. Then you're going to really hate it. And I was like, actually, we enjoyed our first year. It was awesome. We had a great time. Uh, it was before kids, and you could just get in the car and go. Now it's like a feat, an act of Congress to get little ones in the car. It's constant negotiations with our five-year-old. Um, we don't even say, you know, we don't even say, go do this. Now we're like, do you want to put on your right shoe first or your left shoe first? Because shoes are getting put on, but it's just a matter of which one. I'll let you choose. I'll let you, I'll give you the option. But we're going to move forward, Stella. Uh, we're going to move. She's five, uh, going on 15. But we're going to move forward together. Uh, but those were uh, a little bit easier, uh, easier times when it was just, just the two of us. But today I'm going to go to the text, 
And uh, I'm just going to stay with the handheld. I'm already in it. Sorry. I was like, I'm, we, we talked about using this. Should I try to use this just for fun? You know what, Lynn? Why not? Why not? We're talking about change. All right. There's that. All right. We ready? Powering down in three, two. My check. Voila. Are we good on that? All right. The only problem is now we got this thing in the front of me, and that's going to distract me. Um, I will warn you, if this, by the way, if this does turn into a marriage, you're going to have to, you're going to just have to put up with one of my faults, and that's my S's are just sharp. Uh, when I was in my 20s, one of my roommates, he's like, hey, you have a speech impediment. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> and then he's like, the way that you say 20, I can't even say it, 20. How do you guys say 20? 20, yeah. Maybe it's a California thing. We say it with a chwa. Who says it with a chwa? You say 20. Okay. Yeah, I say with a chwa. Um, but um, anyways. All right. Let's go to the text. Gospel of John, chapter number 17. I hear a little bit of feedback. Just a little bit. Okay. If, if it doesn't work, I'll switch back to handheld. But it is nice having my hands free. I feel like it's karate chop something if I need to. John 17, 22 and 23 says this. This is one of Jesus' last recorded prayers. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. Come on, say those three words, such perfect unity. Say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. All right, let's do it one more time together in unison. One, two, three. Such perfect unity. Beautiful. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Your word will endure. Heaven and earth will pass away, but it is your word that will endure forever. Speak to us in these moments as we endeavor on this path of unity in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. Um, our son, Winston, uh, last year started playing piano. And he'd been talking about playing piano for a while, but he started uh, piano lessons. And there's a gentleman in, in our church. His daughter was taking piano lessons. And she said, Dad, I'm done. And he had already paid for it a couple of months ahead of time. So he said, hey, Pastor Wes, we've got these piano lessons. Uh, do you want to give them to your boy? And I was like, you know what? We've been talking about it. Great. And then he showed up at my house. He's like, hey, i got to drop off something at your house. I'm like, okay. So he showed up at our house with a keyboard, too. Brand new keyboard. Uh, uh, some of our community will know him, Carlos, a.k.a. Carlitos for Christ. Uh, so Carlos shows up at our house. And he's like, Pastor Wes, i got this piano. I just want to bless your boy. I'm like, man, this is so cool. And, uh, and then uh, the, the lesson started, which was awesome, and so he's learning all of his scales. Uh, one of the things that he's really excited about learning right now is the final countdown. If you guys know the song, dun -dun 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 -dun. he's pumped about it. He loves it. He's like, Dad, he's showing videos to all his friends. Guys, I can play uh, the final countdown, which I'm just as excited for. I'm like, Winston, this is so cool. You know, forget Beethoven and Bach. This is what you want to be learning. Kids playing instruments by themselves, they, they can sound okay. Uh, but when you get those kids with other kids who also only kind of play the instrument, um, it's less of a symphony and more of a cacophony. <laughs> They're all playing their own parts, not quite in unison. Uh, the conductor, if there is one, uh, you can hear them, they're, they're, they're not doing this, down, in, out, up. They're not doing this, they're like banging on something like a metronome. They're not together, they're not in unison. It's just a, just a lot of noise. Uh, if any of you ever were in a garage band in high school or your kids were in a garage band in high school, you know that it's just, it's just a lot of activity that is looking like a band, but it's not quite a band because they are not in unison. Jesus' last prayer for his church, recorded through the Gospel of John in chapter number 17, is that the church would be one. He says that they may be, and that word there in the Greek is like a state of being, it's an existence. It's not an event. 
It's not, the, it, it's not this one-time moment, but a state of existence. It's like this homeostasis. It's a stain of the same. It's a bringing together moment. He says that they would be one, and that word one is the Greek word hen, which is actually the letter one. It's a letter one, as opposed to different parts. It's not just a gathering of parts together. It is one singular part. You know, it's interesting if you ever go to uh, concerts. Recently, uh, my wife and I were at an event, and everyone at the event uh, got tickets to the Hollywood Bowl. And so, and actually we forgot about this until like the other day, I was like going through a pile of papers. We have that junk drawer in our house. You guys, does everyone have that same junk drawer? Uh, ours is in a closet by the front door. And it's like where I put like the mail that I'm not sure what to do with yet. It's not a bill that's due, but it's something that's important, but I'll get around to it. Uh, I was going through that pile and I found, I was like, oh my goodness, babe, we've got tickets to the Hollywood Bowl. When are we gonna put this together? And there is, a, there is a, a, a contrast of unity and at the same time something that appears as unity. Let me explain. When you go to the Hollywood Bowl, and if they're doing something very cool, maybe they're doing uh, Thomas Newman or they're doing a Star Wars. I mentioned Star Wars two weeks in a row. Now you guys are going to think I'm a Star Wars nerd. But anyways, they're, they're doing some kind of a, a, a thing together. Everyone up front must be in unity. If one person is off, everyone notices the strings are off. I mean, the horns are off. That, that, that one player is off. You can even see, because I, I used to play violin uh, for about six years, you can even see, I, I always notice when the strings are, when, when the bows are not all going in the same direction, when one person's going up, even if they're playing the same notes, you realize, oh, they didn't reset at that measure when they were supposed to reset. They're not in correct unison, even if it's that one person. But even if they are in unity, there's actually a stark contrast because the people in the audience, they are all gathered together for the same thing, but you wouldn't say that the people are in unity. They are gathered together for an event, but they're not in unity. They're gathered together for a brief moment, facing the same way, attention directed the same way, but yet they are not in unity. They are at the same event. A, a unity is not being at the same event together. Unity is going in the same direction together. So Jesus, his prayer is that they would be one. And then he says this, that they would be one, Father, as you and I are one. As you and I are one, my prayer is that, our, uh, that, that the church would be in unity, Father, as you and I are one. Now, if we want to dive into this a little bit, you have to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, in the doctrine of the Trinity, the, the word Trinity actually doesn't appear in the Bible anywhere. However, uh, it is a word used and utilized by the early church fathers to describe this doctrine of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one, uh, just uh, one, but distinguishable yet indivisible. Justin Martyr, uh, who lived from 100 to 165, he wrote in his first apology, he wrote this phrase, in the name of God the Father and Lord of the universe and of our Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Ignatius of Antioch in 110 said that obedience to Christ and to the Father and to the Spirit. Tertullian later on in that century said this, uh, he created an argument for the faith to explain the Trinity. And of course, as we note, the Council of Nicaea, through the Nicaean Creed in 325, uh, they wrote out this beautiful creed to explain and to unify the church around this doctrine of the Trinity. All of this was an attempt to explain the beauty and harmony of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in that moment in John 17, says, Father, in the same way that you and I are one, distinguishable yet indivisible, in the same way that you and I are one, my prayer is that our church would be that. Distinguishable yet indivisible. Copy and paste. In the same way 
that the Father and the Son are one. His prayer for his church is that the church would be one. We never, can you imagine Jesus going to pray for someone and there being a division between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine Jesus, you know, the, the leper's like, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, I will have mercy on you. The Father's like, I don't know about this. Do you hear what he said yesterday? And the Holy Spirit's like waking up. He's like, oh, wait, what, what are you guys doing? Hold on, I haven't even woken up yet. We got to get together. We got to have a council about this. We got to have, we got to talk. There's got to be a vote in unison. No, there's no division between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're, 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 they're distinguishable yet indivisible. And so Jesus says, my prayer is that our church would be distinguishable yet indivisible. Someone said, Amen. Oh, right, let's try that again. Someone said amen. amen. How can two churches, one that's over 100 years and one that's barely almost maybe five years, if you count all the from conception to now, how does this not turn into an eclectic mixture together? How does this not turn into polka dots and stripes together? How does this not turn into one side here and one side there? How does this not turn into, you know, this eclectic thing? How does this not turn into that? Jesus' prayer out of John 17 says this, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. The only way that this happens is that it's a supernatural thing. And the only way that unity is possible is if Jesus is at the center. I laugh, by the way, I laugh at what I used to wear 20, 30 years ago. You guys, it's like, it's, it's funny every couple of years on social media, they do the throwbacks. Uh, back when Twitter was like the main social platform, they did Throwback Thursday. And, and then some people, they would miss Throwback Thursday. They're like, oh, but can I do a Flashback Friday? Can I get like a, a gimme on that? And then... Uh, on, on Instagram and on Facebook, they started popping in like, well, what about us here? And here's the throwback. And, and then now they've got these videos. And if you've ever seen these videos, it's on like Instagram reels or you've seen on TikTok and things like that. Or maybe people have shared on Facebook. And then they show someone later in life and then they show them earlier in life and they had no idea that later in life that that beautiful thing was going to happen. And it's like, you're like, oh my gosh, he did not only learn how to ride a bike, but he was in the BMX X Games. And oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. He did it. She did it. This is amazing. But if you ever do that and you look back at what you wore 20, 30 years ago, isn't that just like the most embarrassing thing? Or at the way you styled your home 20, 30 years ago? Or at the music that you may have listened to? I know that there's some cult classics out there. I listen to all my running playlists. I've got some 70s. I've got some 60s. I've got the 80s. I kind of passed over a couple of that and go straight into the 90s because I'm I was born in 82, so 90s when I first started listening to music, and it's like I've got all my 90s R&B and hip-hop in there, and I'm running up my hill, and I'm listening to it. But if you ever looked at what you used to wear 20, 30 years ago, it's embarrassing. Can you imagine uh, basing your whole life on what you used to wear 20, 30 years ago? No. You'd be like, no. I, it's like someone would say, I will wear this shirt, you know, for forever. The only way that this is possible is that if we don't base our lives in the future on what is changing, like styles and trends, but that we base it on what is unchanging. Jesus' prayer, I am in them and you are in me, they, they experience such perfect unity. Instead of Communities, and by the way, communities is not, it's not a, you know, like even our church at five years old, we can have our own things. Like we hold on to this and it's like, give it a couple of years and that's going to change. Give it a little bit of time and culture will shift and we'll look back like, do you remember when we used to do that, right? The only way that this happens is that if we focus on the one thing that won't ever change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's described as both the Alpha and the Omega. And the only way that this happens is if we focus on what is unchanging. 
this is a result. This is the exciting part of like, all right, pastor, why put in all that work? Why put in all that work in a unity and the two becoming one? Why should we put in all of that work? And this is why I want to talk to you about the results. The results. The results is this. He says this, that the world will know. That the world will know. That Northridge will know. That Reseda will know. Come on, you see where I'm going with this. That Los Angeles will know. That CSUN will know. That, uh, that um, you know, USC will know. That UCLA will know. That our city will know. F.F. Bruce, the great commentator, says it like this, a unity which has its route within the soul but is manifested in outward action. Another way to say it, a unity that can be seen. A unity that can be seen. It's not a concert of a bunch of people coming to an event together, but it's a unity that can be seen. If we can pull this off together, let me just say, because we're talking about where, where we can go together. If we can pull this off together, not just me as pastor, but as the two becoming one, our city and our world will look in and say, only God can do that. Oh, that, that's a God thing. Only God can bring together these two different worlds and bring them into one in an atmosphere of unity and harmony where Jesus is at the center and the world will see and go, only God can do that. And if you were to ask me what I think is happening, I think, I think this, if I could sum it up in this, and I wrote it out, you'll see it up on the board, is that God is unifying two churches into one for the sake of kingdom work that can only be done with unity. God is unifying your prayers with our prayers for the sake of kingdom work that is yet to be done in this city. Missional work that is yet to be done in this city. One of the scriptures that Pastor Dan and I have talked a lot about over these last couple months together is in Ezekiel 37, 19, where God tells Ezekiel to, to grab these two sticks, and he says this, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am about to take the stick of Joseph that is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel associated with them, and I will join with the stick of Judah and make them one stick, that they may be one in my hand. I think that most of us, or all of us, could say that we want to see a move of God. One of the things our church is doing right now uh, is... We've been talking about different moves of God, and we've been going through what's called uh, revival history or modern uh, different church movement history. And we've been studying both the, the Billy Graham uh, revival uh, here in Los Angeles in 1949, where one out of six people in Los Angeles heard the gospel through Billy Graham's lips. And it was literally because William Randolph Hearst, the great media mogul, sent a telegram to his people. And he said two words, Puff Graham. And he wasn't even a religious man. He was just saying, hey, I think that it, it, he was like the TMZ of their era. And he's like, go check out what's going on over there. And then their tent grew from, from 3,000 to 6,000 to 9,000. And it went from three weeks on to, uh, to eight weeks. And one out of six people in Los Angeles heard the gospel. Or if you go back a little bit further to the early 1900s in the Azusa Street Revival, where a one-eyed African-American man led this incredible movement of now what has become churches around the world. Or how about this, the Jesus People Movement here in Southern California, where chapels and churches were launched and people who came into the church that we, you would never expect. Can you imagine some of those people that you go, oh, so-and-so would never come to church? Well, they came to church and they saw it. And they experienced it. And my prayer right now is I'm like, Lord, I don't want to miss your next move. I don't want to miss your next move because it didn't look like your last move. I don't want to miss Billy Graham's revival because I was stuck on Azusa Street revival. 
I don't want to miss the Jesus people movement where hundreds of thousands of youth and hippies and barefoot and they're coming up drugs and they're coming down from highs and they're experiencing Jesus. And yeah, there was a lot of weirdness, but man, did God move. I don't want to miss that move because I'm stuck on Billy Graham's revival in the sawdust trail. And I don't want to miss the next move of God because it doesn't look like Jesus people movement. I think that the, that the Lord is, and if you look in Genesis, the Genesis account of creation where it says that the Holy Spirit is brooding over creation and then God said. You guys know that passage, right? The, the Spirit of God was brooding over the face of the waters and it was without form and it was void. And then God said, let there be light. And there's like, I feel that brooding of the Holy Spirit over our city right now. And I'm like, God, if you say something, it happens. If you say, let there be light at, at CSUN, guess what, baby, there's going to be light. If you say, let there be another youth revival, then come on, Jesus, let it happen. If you say, let there be a small group revival where there's Bible studies popping up all throughout the city and coffee shops are overwhelmed and they turn into miniature churches. God, if you say it, it will happen. And, and, and so when I see the Lord bringing these two becoming one, that there's this rich heritage and then there's this energy and God's bringing these two things, these two sticks into one, I go, imagine what could happen. And Jesus prayed. He says, I pray that they would be one as, Father, as you and I are one and that the world around us will see and they'll say, only God could do that. Some of you may have lost friends over these last two or three years. There were so many things to disagree on. Like there, there, there's a menu of things to disagree on, right? It's like, all right, where are you out of the COVID? All right, where are we out of the vax? Okay, all right, all right, we're still friends. Where are you about the election? All right, let's see if we're still friends. All right, where are you about the current state of California? All right, why are we still friends? There, there's all these things that divide. Everyone kind of went to their corners, and they drew a line in the sand. It's like, okay, us four no more. You guys stay over there. You guys are the, you know, the, the, this group that we only believe on the first two check marks, but the last check mark, man, you are dead to me. Go over there to that corner. And there's all these things that could divide our world. Our world is living in division right now. Have you, have you ever posted something on Facebook and you're like tentative about it? You're like, today was a good day. And you're like, am I allowed, like if you're married, you're like, am I allowed to say that right now? Is that, does that come off with the right tone? <laughs> How dare you say that today's a good day? Don't you know that? What today? It's like, no, I didn't know. Fine, I won't say anything. I just, I'll just, I'll be back over here. It's a picture of my dog. That's safe. Did you get your dog from a breeder or did you rescue? Okay, all right, fine. No dogs, no pictures, no status. I'll just go hide under a rock. They're like, thank you. That's what we wanted. Our world is living in division. Division has become the norm. But when unity happens, people go, wait a minute. How, how did you guys all come together? And they go, there is no way. Ain't no way. There's no way that that age and that age and that race and that race and that political bent and that political bent could all come together in the same place to worship Jesus that the world may know. That type of unity gathered around, not a paint color or a title, but gathered around Jesus. When people see that, they go, only God can do that. I believe that right now together, between our churches, we have the people, the gifts, the spiritual gifts, the talents, the abilities to see a great move of God here in Los Angeles. I really do. We have more than enough. Sometimes the Lord brings us into these scenarios where he gives us, you know, a couple loaves of bread, two small fish, and you just got to believe God for a miracle. And there's other times where the God brings you all the ingredients and you're like, oh, there's a lot of it. We, we can do a lot together. But practically, here's what I believe the future could look like for us. And it's summed up in this phrase, new life. You guys got that up there? Boom, boom, boom. New life. There it is. Where our city desperately needs to experience the new, the new life that only Jesus can give. And so we together, as two congregations, we will actively commit ourselves to this effort as one 
unified church. And then on January 29th, as we have worked together for unity together, we're setting a date. We're saying, okay, on January 29th, we're going to invite our friends, our neighbors, our family, and our city to come and experience this new life with us with new worship songs, a fresh disciple-making process, and a renewed focus on children and youth. Someone said amen. Together, we will be used to expand God's kingdom from one generation to the next. I believe that we live in such a broken world and in a divided city, and our city desperately needs to experience this new life that only Jesus can give. And I believe that we should actively commit ourselves to that effort. And as we become a united body together, that is when we will launch that initiative together and invite our city in and say, you know what, come see this work that God is doing. Come and see. And in the months and years following this, we will be a community that continues to help people connect with God, grow in community, discover their purpose, and make a difference together. We will be a unified church working together for kingdom cause. Connie, you can come on up on the keys. and I'm just going to close out right here. Eugene Peterson says that the phrase in his book, uh, they call me pastor. He says pastor is one of the most honored and even holy titles. I love Eugene Peterson because not only is he a translator, was a translator, but he's just a pastor. He's just a pastor who loved the congregation for a long time. But he says it's one of the most honored and holy titles. And as we consider these next steps together as the two becoming one, I just want you to know I would be incredibly honored to be called your pastor. Right on beat, man. That's great. There you go. <laughs> but I would be incredibly honored. Because it's not just about the location or the brand, but it's about the mission that the Lord has ahead for all of us here in Los Angeles. And to be a part of that mission, to be a part of that story, to be a part of the history that I believe that the Lord is writing here in Los Angeles. What an honor to be a part of that. You know, my dad, uh, he came to faith, as many of you guys know, um, at a winter camp, and, but he began his journey of faith here at this church. The church had just opened up its building. My dad walked those halls and began his journey of faith. He would go on to school, UC Santa Barbara for a little bit. And I remember him telling me the stories of what it was like during the Jesus People movement. And seeing people coming to God, seeing people come off drugs, seeing like just, and also just the tensions, oh man, the, 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 the racial and the political tensions, the Vietnam tension, all, all those tensions were all happening simultaneously. And um, And what a thought to see that in real life. Sometimes you don't know that it's there until afterwards. And you look back and you go, wow, yeah, that was really cool. I feel like that we are at the very beginning of a moment like that. And so when I say, hey, I would, I would be incredibly honored, it's because I see the, the gravity of the journey ahead. And I know I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that journey. I want to be a part of the revival here in Los Angeles. I want to be a part of the, the wave of people who turn their hearts back to Jesus at CSUN. I want to be a part of one of those things that it's like, you know what, it got a little bit messy and and I, you know, maybe it was like, you know, when you see the Jesus people movement and people are getting baptized in ponds and it's like, I don't know if I would be down with that. Like, you know. But people's lives were changed. 
whether we would all um, jump on board with everything, you know, Vineyard and Calvary Chapel and all the different movements that came out of Shiloh's homes and things like that that came out of that movement. I think everyone can agree that God was doing something great. He was doing something great in a bunch of young people that could have gone the wrong way. And I think that together, collectively, should we take a step forward together in this perfect unity together. I think the world around us, by Jesus' prayer, the world will see. The world will see. Father, like you are in me and I am in them, that they would know that perfect love. I would love to pray for us uh, together. Can you just bow your heads and Jesus, thank you for what you were doing. You said you would build your church. And literally the gates of hell itself would not prevail against your church. That the gates of hell itself would not possess enough authority to stop your church. Jesus, we want to see a move of God here in Los Angeles. We don't want to just read about it. We don't want to be historians about it. We actually want to see it in our lives. We want to see it not only now, but in the next generation and in the next generation and in the next generation. And should you tarry in the next generation as well. Lord, thank you, God, for the just the incredible legacy, the legacy of faith of this community. And I pray, Lord, for such a perfect 